Without further ado, let's get started. And we're going to talk about how to monitor machine learning models without getting drowned in false alerts. On the agenda today, we have six items, which is quite a lot. First, we're going to introduce the problem and we're going to talk why machine learning monitoring is important. So we're going to talk about what happens after you deploy your machine learning models to production and what are the typical problems that most of the data science teams uh, need to deal with to make sure that the models keep on delivering value. Uh, then we're going to talk about a typical way of trying to address the problem, which is detecting model degradation with data threats. So we're going to talk about what are the potential data detection tools that you can use and why, unfortunately, none of them actually addresses the problem uh, in a kind of surprising way that it actually doesn't work at all if we look at the data. Uh, and then once we uh, figure out that the typical solution doesn't work, then we're going to try to figure out how can we, and if it's possible at all, uh, to quantify the impact of data drift on model performance. And we're going to build the intuition that it is indeed possible. And uh, we're going to start building the understanding of how we can potentially build an algorithm that would allow us to do so. And then we're going to have two algorithms uh, that allow us to actually quantify the impact of data drift on model performance. It's all without uh, access to labels, of course, access to target data. And uh, the first one is going to talk about performance estimation for classification. We'll talk about CVP, our, I think, best known algorithm that we developed at ManyML and open source. And then we're going to talk about uh, performance estimation for regression. Uh, and then we're going to, which is another open source algorithm that we developed at ManyML that allows you to estimate model performance for regression metrics. And of course, we're going to wrap up with the summary. So let's get started with the post deployment problems. The first uh, really big problem is that models degrade in time. When you release a model to production or when you deploy the model to production, uh, sooner or later, the predictions of that models will deteriorate. What I mean by that is that by any measure of your model performance, your performance will drop. Whether you have a classification use case and you measure your model performance by F1 or a regression use case and you measure your model performance by, let's say, RMSE, uh, that metric will drop in time. There is a very nice study from 2022 called Temporal Quality Degradation in AI Models that was published in Nature. Uh, and this is kind of their flagship image. And basically what we see here is that they trained a lot of different models on a lot of different data sets. And then they measured the model error. And we're going to go too much in depth here how they define it, but it's like a unified metric across different uh, possible performance measurements. And uh, what you see here is that on average, these models really decay a lot and almost all of them actually degrade sig significantly. And in some really bad cases, you might even see, let's say, tenfold or even more increase in your model error, which is obviously terrible because it means that your model is nowhere near as good as it used to be. So we need to be able to catch that. We need to be able to figure out that something is going wrong with our predictions. And ideally, we want to do it before uh, we actually lose money because the model mispredicted on some really important uh, rows for a very long time. So we want to catch it as soon as possible. Why? Because the targets arrive after the damage is done. We cannot, unfortunately, just measure the performance. Uh, we'll have to do something else. Uh, if we were lucky enough that targets, we would get the actual targets we were trying to predict right after we make the predictions, that would be really nice because then we could always say that the model is deteriorating now and we should do something about it. Unfortunately, the whole idea of machine learning is to predict something that will either happen in the future or to automate some kind of job that was done or is being done manually by a human and to automate that job or at least augment it. So what we're saying is that the model will ingest the inputs, uh, will then spit out some predictions, uh, whether it's, again, a classification, regression model, or even a generative model. There's going to be something that this model outputs. Based on that, uh, we're going to take business actions. And then waiting a while, we're going to get business impact. And generally speaking, only after we see this business impact, or I would say almost always, only, only after we see this business impact, we'll get the targets. To give you an example here, imagine that we're trying to predict churn and we're trying to predict churn for a telecom three months ahead. So what happens is we're predicting that a given person is not going to churn. The business action here is to do nothing 
And then the business impact, hopefully, is again, we saved the money, we didn't target that person with retention campaigns. Uh, and then we see, uh, let's say, month four or month six, that that person, whether that person churned or not. And if that person actually churned, our model mispredicted, so predicted incorrectly. And if we see this happening for a lot of predictions, we will actually all know that the model was wrong after six months, uh, which of course means that the predictions for all the future months, of course, are already bad. So we're going to basically deal with six months of bad model. And it's not something we can stop. It's not something that we can really avoid in any way if we wait for the targets to arrive. So uh, now I'm going to talk about three ways that the targets are actually not here. What I already discussed is the delayed targets when the targets do arrive, but they arrive later in time. And this is very typical for some of the prediction use cases. Uh, not for all prediction use cases, but for some of the prediction use cases, we're going to get the full targets after a certain amount of time. Uh, sometimes, which is uh, even worse, the targets are missing fully. We're going to make the predictions, we're going to take business actions, we're going to get business impact, and we will never know whether the actual prediction was correct. An example here would be insurance pricing. When we give a price for an insurance, and we won't know for a very, very long time whether the price was correct or not, because uh, normally this insurance pricing is done by a human that just prices it, and this is what we treat as ground truth. Then the model was uh, trained on that uh, on that past data where actual analysts uh, analyzed the all the people that applied for insurance and gave them a specific price. And now, right now, that is missing. So we will actually never know uh, whether that uh, prediction would have been the same as uh, a human prediction or the human price. Uh, another typical use case here is defect prediction in manufacturing when we're trying to predict defects. It, there used to be, uh, back in the day before it was all automated, uh, special people that just worked in quality uh, assurance in manufacturing when they inspected some or most of the products, depending on the price of the products. Uh, nowadays, most of that is done with computer vision when uh, the, the actual product is inspected visually, automatically. And then if there is a defect, the product is automatically discarded, uh, which means that the people that work with quality assur assurance now will no longer see that product. And if it's discarded, we'll be basically stuck with it forever, even if that uh, product should not have been discarded and it was not defect. Then the last type of uh, issue with the targets that we have are the sensor targets. And this is slightly hard to explain, but unfortunately, the most typical uh, way that we're dealing with targets in production. Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean? So in short, it just means that only some of the targets arrive. We will get some of the targets, but not all of the targets. Uh, let me explain here how this typically works. Imagine that we uh, deal with the classification use case, uh, with the binary classification use case, when we want to predict uh, whether some specific event happens. And if that event happens, we're going to take some action. Let's say that we predict churn. If churn happens, we're going to try to uh, stop that person from churning, right? If we see, predict that this person is going to churn within three months, we're going to trigger some retention action. We're going to try to stop that person from churning. If we are trying to predict uh, credit loan defaults, if we predict that the person is going to default on the loan, then we're not going to give them the loan. And Lastly, let's say we work in predictive maintenance. If we see that there is an issue of the machine or there will be an issue of the machine in the next, let's say six weeks, then we're gonna maintain the machine to make sure that this issue doesn't happen. So we're gonna take the business action based on that positive prediction. And if we, let's say, maintain the machine and machine didn't break, that means that the uh, targets potentially change due to the business action, because we will never know whether that machine would have broken if we had not maintained it. Uh, and obviously it's not something we can just say, okay, let's not maintain the machine get the uh, and still get the targets because that would defeat the whole purpose of predictive maintenance. Uh, in some other use cases, like with uh, credit default prediction, uh, we will not give that person a loan. So we will never actually know whether that person would have defaulted on the loan if we had given it to them. So the targets are just fully absent because we, uh, did some business action, which is denying the loan. Uh, so if that happens, what we see here is that we will get part of the confusion matrix. So for all the negative predictions, 
we don't know whether uh, the prediction was correct or not, whether the person defaulted or not after we've given them the loan, or whether machine broke after we said that there is no issue in the machine. But for all the positive predictions, we will actually never get the ground truth at all. Of course, there is methods to deal with that at this partial, such as reject inference uh, or doing spot checks, but it's not something that we can do for uh, with full certainty and for the entire population. Uh, now, we have those problems. Who can solve those problems? Generally speaking, we have three kinds of, uh, let's say, jobs or three personas that carry the most and interact the most with machine learning models. It is the machine learning engineer who puts the models in production and, generally speaking, makes sure that the predictions happen. Uh, then we have the data scientist who makes sure that the models actually get developed and that they actually fulfill a business need and work well. And then we have a business stakeholder who defines what problems need to be solved and then uses those predictions to do some kind of downstream tasks like uh, triggering retention actions for churn prediction models. So now we should decide basically whether there is a one person that's really best suited for solving those problems or whether there should be a specific owner. And fortunately for us, uh, there is that specific person, but let's go step by step by what are the kind of qualifications or the criteria uh, that each of these jobs should meet uh, to be well qualified uh, to monitor models in production. The first thing you need to have is the business understanding. You need to understand what is the actual impact of the model and uh, how the model was developed, what are the things that go into the model, what are the features, and what happens if the model starts making specific kinds of errors. This is something that machine learning engineers are generally are not well versed in, and most of them don't really care about it because they focus on deploying the models and making sure that the actual, the entire orchestration and instrumentation is in place to make sure that the predictions arrive in time and manner. Uh, data scientists, of course, needs to know what is the actual uh, use case and what is the impact of the use case. Otherwise, they won't be able to define the correct evaluation metric and build a model that fulfills the business needs. And again, of course, uh, business needs are defined by the business stakeholders. So again, the business stakeholder is a good person uh, for having good business understanding. It's kind of obvious, of course. Now, the second really important vital skill is to have machine learning skills, machine learning acumen. And here, generally speaking, machine learning engineers are not a bad candidate because they understand machine learning reasonably well. And nowadays, most of their expertise is, again, in deploying the models and building the models, but they know how to build a simple model. Data scientists are basically a perfect choice here. And of course, business stakeholders are typically not technical people, so they don't really know how to build machine learning models. The reason it's important is that if something breaks, is a, if a feature, if the performance drops, we need to be able to figure out what is actually going on. We need to be able to do a root cause analysis and kind of figure out what went wrong and how to fix it. And while we can provide a lot of tools to make this job easier, there still needs to be a human in the loop that takes the decision. And for that, data scientist is the best person. Uh, then finally, uh, the last, uh, kind of skill set is use case understanding. And here I mean use case understanding from the technical perspective. Uh, so we need to know which features are important, which features are stable, which features we expect to work well, um, what are the typical issues with the machine learning algorithm that we chose, and what are the typical failure modes of the machine learning algorithm we chose to uh, implement here. And again, machine learning engineers would be good when it comes to the second part and understanding specific machine learning algorithms. Business stakeholder is probably very good when it comes to understanding specific features. And it's normally that kind of person that we go to, the main experts to really understand uh, what are the potentially useful data sources. Uh, but data scientists, is, again, is the best person because they combine uh, this kind of understanding of machine learning algorithms and uh, the actual features that go and the data that go into the model. So uh, it's kind of, there is a kind of obvious conclusion that follows, which is that the data scientist is uh, the most qualified person to actually solve the problems in post-deployment data science. So now that we've defined what are the problems and who should own it, let's talk about how we can generally try to solve the problem with just looking at uh, the data drift. So the idea here, the intuition here is, if something happens with our model input distribution, so the data drifts in some ways, 
uh, we can potentially use it as a proxy for model performance because if there is a strong change in the joint model input distribution, uh, then the model will probably not be well suited to handle the data that comes from outside the distribution that uh, the model was trained on. Let's talk about why this is unfortunately not the case and why we cannot use uh, data-driven signals directly as a proxy for performance. So I'm going to build the case here uh, based on this plot. This plot is quite heavy. And, and let me explain it step by step. So what, what you see here is we're going to try to predict uh, the change of model performance here defined as ROC AUC or ROC uh, area under the uh, ROC AUC curve. And what we're going to uh, do here is we're going to basically took a lot of data sets and we measured how they change and whether we can use some kind of data loop signals to actually predict that change in performance. Uh, so the easiest way to estimate model performance is to just use the test set performance. And what you see here is basically a straight line. It's a perfectly straight line that goes from uh, one standard deviation to 10 standard deviations, uh, where the model assumes no change. So our error uh, must use just a fancy name for um, squared error uh, that we use. We use it across different data sets. That's why the name is slightly different. But what you need to know is we're looking at the squared error of our performance estimation and the actual change, uh, sorry, mean squared error, root mean squared error of the actual performance estimation and the actual change of ROC AUC. And if we assume that there is no change, uh, then the error in our estimation is going to be just straight, straight equal the actual change because we're assuming that the performance is constant. And of course, we want to do better than the test set. Uh, if we cannot do better than the test set, it means that our whatever algorithm we have uh, does worse than just assuming that there is no change in the performance. So, of course, not something that we want to use. And now uh, let's look at using specific univariate drift detection methods uh, to try to build a machine learning model that will try to estimate model performance based on the drift, uh, data drift signals. So we trained a couple of models. We trained logistic regression that takes univariate uh, drift detection using Jensen Shannon distance when we just compare two different distributions. Uh, we also did chi square um, statistics, so one distance measure and one statistical measure. And we are trying to see if we can use uh, the value of that. So we're using both the p value and the actual statistic. And for JS, we are just using the, the value of uh, the distance that we're seeing. And we're trying to use that to predict model performance. And what you see here is that if we train a very simple model, uh, it will actually do worse uh, than constant. And if we train a model that's well regularized, uh, the machine learning model will kind of realize that there is no signal in the data and it will just discard all the features, uh, so all the signals and output a constant prediction. And this is exactly what we see with the random forest here, uh, which lies straight underneath uh, the flat curve uh, because it basically discards all the signal in the data, it realizes that there is no signal in the data. And then we train a logistic regression model, uh, and we'll see that uh, it actually does significantly worse than just use, assuming that the performance is constant. It learns spurious patterns in our training set, which then don't exist in production anymore. So we see that we cannot use uh, univariate data drift uh, for predicting performance. Why is that? So basically, it comes from two or even three sides. First, the false positives are bound to happen if we, and they are bound to happen quite often if we have enough uh, features. Let's say that our model has 100 or 200 or 300 features. What will happen is that some of them will drift significantly, but the model will generally handle that well. So we're going to get a lot of false positives. We're going to get a lot of false signals uh, that then a machine learning model either will learn to ignore or will falsely interpret as signal. The second reason is that the models are, sorry, the models are robust change in data distribution, which means that even if we see actual meaningful change, that's not just a statistical fluke, uh, it still doesn't mean that it actually impacts performance in any way. 
uh, because even if the data looks completely different, especially on features that are not very important, we don't expect to see a drift in performance or change in performance. Or if data drifts to regions that are equally easy to predict on as the data distribution that we mostly saw in the test set, uh, we still don't expect to see a drop in performance. And then lastly, if we stick with univariate methods, then the drift in the relationship between features is not captured. And uh, to illustrate that point, I have this visualization here. When we look at two features, and we see that if we look at it from the univariate standpoint, the, the univariate distributions are virtually uh, the same. They are virtually identical. But if we look at the 2D plot, what we see is that the feature got actually rotated by 90 degrees. Uh, so there is insanely strong data drift. Uh, most likely the features actually got swapped somewhere in the data engineering pipeline. Uh, but we see that univariate detection will actually not detect it. Of course, this is a fake example that still can happen in the real world because we saw features just getting swapped, the names of features getting swapped, but the actual features are staying the same, which means that the algorithm will interpret it exactly as you see here by rotating it. So this is something that can happen, even a slightly contrived example. You can clearly imagine that there might be a very strong drift in the correlations or relationship between features, but we won't be able to catch it with just univariate drift detection methods. Now let's look at multivariate detection methods. So uh, what we see here is uh, we've trained our multivariate detection method uh, that uh, does PCA reconstruction. Uh, so we measure the reconstruction error of PCA in reverse PCA using the PCA model or algorithm trained on our test set. And then we see whether that uh, PCA fitted PCA object, I'm not going to call it model, uh, that fitted PCA object is able to uh, reconstruct data well on our production data. And we see that it is a slightly better signal in the sense that it doesn't provide uh, nearly as many false alerts as the univariate detection methods, but it still is actually worse than random. There is still a lot of uh, false positives. And as we will see later, also a few false negatives when there is a drop in model performance. But even multivariate detection methods that are much more powerful than univariate detection methods are still not able to capture the impact of data drift on model performance. And this is an example here. Uh, we see that there is a strong inc increase in the PCA reconstruction error. It's actually a very sharp increase. So there's definitely a step change in the data distribution. And yet, uh, model performance is uh, not affected. Uh, so now we're going to just give you a short glimpse about what we're about to unveil. So there are two machine learning methods for detecting uh, or estimating model performance without ground truth. One of them is called uh, CPP, which we open sourced, and one of them is called FAPE, which we have in our uh, cloud product. And they actually are able to estimate model performance significantly better than the test set data. And of course, by extension, really significantly better than any of the univariate detection methods, given that all the univariate or multivariate detection methods are actually worse than the test set. Now, how can we go about actually trying to estimate this uh, model performance? How can we start building these algorithms? So first, uh, let's talk about what can actually impact model performance. Uh, and there are two kinds of change in the model distribution, or not only input, but generally, there are two kinds of data drift. The first one is covariate shift. Covariate shift can be defined as the change in the joint feature distribution or joint model input distribution. So to use a very simple example here, you can just see that we have one dimensional data uh, with just one feature, and that distribution changes in time uh, after we deploy our model to production. So it's just the change in P of X. Then the second type of data drift is, so, is called concept drift, when the relationship between uh, model inputs and the target changes. Uh, in other words, the distribution of the targets conditioned on joint model input distribution changes. Uh, so here we see that if we experience pure covariate, uh, covariate drift without, uh, sorry, pure concept drift without any covariate shift, uh, we see uh, that the distribution stays the same, but the ratio of positive to negative classes changes. So 
However, whatever was the actual function that connected the model inputs to the targets is now different. And from now on, we're going to be focusing on, just like actually previously, on covariance detection techniques. All the algorithms are mentioned before, and generally all the algorithms that we can use without access to ground truth deal with detecting covariance shifts. So they only detect one specific type of uh, data. And here again, because we don't have access to targets, we cannot say much about concept drift. What we're going to focus on is we're going to focus on quantifying the impact of covariance shift on model performance. All right, so let's get started with the intuition. What you see here is again, we're going to have a very simple example when we have just one feature X, and we're going to try um, to find the best way to predict uh, our target Y, which is a continuous target. So we're dealing with a simple regression model. We built our best possible bias optimal plus, uh, sorry, regressor, which happens to be just a linear regression. So I build this data that way. So we're going to get the best possible machine learning model uh, being a very simple straight line. And we see also another thing here, which is the level of the noise in the data is not uniform. And this is not just this example, this is a very typical use case when the, you're going to have more noisy data in one region of your space than the other. It basically happens all the time. And what we see here is that there is more noise in the region where X is low and less noise in the region where X is high. That means, just intuitively, if we take the prediction here, we expect to see a higher error of our estimation in that region. And to kind of prove the point that this is indeed the case, I computed the rolling mean error when I just took the absolute error of the estimation. And I computed it in the rolling window size of 100, rolling from left to right along the x-axis. And we see that indeed the error of the estimation drops roughly linearly uh, with x. So the more noise we see in the data, the more noisy our uh, prediction is going to be, which means the less performance our model is going to be. So if we find a way to quantify this level of noise or this model uncertainty, we can then use that as a signal to predict model performance, because we know it's uh, very strongly linked together. Now let's expand more dimensions. And again, let's switch to classification, because why not? And what we see here is a typical XOR problem uh, when we are just trying to find an X or mapping, and we're going to use nonlinear SVM to do it because it gives a very nice smooth plots and smooth lines. And we see here that the model learns very well. Even though we have a tiny bit of noise here, the model generally learns to predict the uh, positive and negative plus quite well. And we see also that the predicted probability is kind of consistent with what we would expect to see, right? In the middle of the positive, uh, sorry, the negative class, the predicted probability is zero. In the middle of the positive class, the predicted probabilities are all very close to one. As we go further away from uh, the region where we have any data, uh, the model becomes less certain. And if we go very close to the class boundary, of course, the model becomes more uncertain again. So then we're going to use that predicted probabilities to kind of measure the confidence of the model. Confidence here I define, I'm not sure if it's a typical definition, but basically we're going to define confidence here as how close the prediction is to either zero or one. And to give you a very simple mathematical formula of that is that we take the predicted probability, we're going to subtract minus uh, 0.5. So we're going to shift it by minus 0.5 to the left. So it kind of centered at zero. We're going to multiply it by two to extend it. So it will now go between minus one and one. And we're going to take the absolute value of that. So we're going to kind of flip the negative sign around, which means that if the model prediction is very close to one, it's going to be very confident. If the model prediction is very close to zero, it's also going to be very confident. If the model uh, prediction or predicted probability is close to 0 0.5, then it's going to be very uncertain. And then voila, we have our uncertainty metric that we can use to estimate model performance. How do we do? So now that we have this map that maps uh, the, basically that takes a point in the feature space and outputs a given confidence, we can use it to see how the data changes in the data distribution. So the covariance shift 
actually impacts performance. What you see here is that let's say that on the test data, uh, we have the same behavior as before. So the data is, is distributed in this kind of Gaussian way. And as we deploy our model to production, uh, our data becomes much more concentrated in the zero, zero region, uh, which means that we would actually expect to see a drop in performance because the average confidence of the model will go down uh, because there is less information in the data, right? If you're right at the class boundary, actually where two class boundaries almost meet. So in this region, uh, it's really impossible to tell whether the uh, model prediction is going to be, sorry, the actual target is going to be positive or negative. Even us as humans wouldn't be able to tell because the data is a bit of uh, a bit noisy there. So we can then, if the data drifts to regions that are more uncertain, when we just have less information about the actual uh, mapping between the model inputs and the targets, we expect to see a drop in performance. Now, kind of on the opposite side of the spectrum, if we see a drift to certain regions or to similar regions to the ones we've seen that the model is confident about, we expect to see, generally speaking, a slight increase in performance uh, or at worst, no change in model performance. So even though we observe very strong drift that would be visible both in univariate and multivariate drift detection methods, uh, there is no impact on model performance. And if anything, the impact is actually positive. And then uh, last, uh, in some ways, most severe way uh, that model uh, that covariate shift can impact model performance is drift to unseen regions when the data is going to drift to a region that was not adequately represented in uh, the training data. And what we see here is that, again, we see expected drop in model performance because the model will likely not generalize well there. And the model itself is actually correctly in confidence about its predictions. So we expect to see a strong drop in model performance. Now, uh, we know how machine learning uh, model performance can be predicted using the uncertainty, which can be constructed via predicted probabilities or somehow quantifying the level of noise in the data. But we also need one more piece of the puzzle here, and that piece of the puzzle is aggregation. So what you see here is that imagine that we just take one data point and we try to estimate its uh, mean squared error based on the expected loss in a given region in the model input space. So kind of the similar idea that we had before, and we're gonna talk about how we can get that loss yet, that will come soon. Uh, but here, what you see is that, let's say that we start with just one or let's say five data points. We'll get some kind of expected loss. We see it's uh, six, uh, 650 which is probably warningly high. But as we get more and more data, we'll see that actually this was not a representative uh, sample. And we see that the actual MSC is high. And of course, even if I didn't uh, kind of bit of bad fight, put, find, start with the points that are kind of on the verge of the actual data distribution, we'd get something that's a bit closer to reality but it would still not give us a very tight and good and precise estimate of the current performance level. So we expect to see a lot of noise if we just sample one or few data points when it comes to our performance estimation. So we should, what we should do instead is we should gather enough data points to have a good representative sample of our current data distribution. So we need to aggregate our data to we get a good performance estimation metric. We do it, generally speaking, by chunking our data by in daily, weekly chunks, maybe monthly chunks, or we can also just say to aggregate data by every, say, 10,000 data points and estimate the model performance for that current chunk of data. And this is exactly what you see here. And again, you see the impact of the expected level of noise. We see a data set where basically there is no change in performance, the performance is constant. And if we chunk our data weekly, when we have more data points per week, we see that the performance is actually really stable and the actual uh, expected uh, confidence bounds, sorry, the actual confidence bounds of the uh, model performance uh, estimation or the performance estimates is reasonably small. So we can be certain that the actual ROC AUC is between 0.96 and 0.98. And we see like a very small drop uh, at this point, but it's probably not significant. So we see consistent behavior and we know uh, that the model performance is not below 0 
However, if we check daily, what we're gonna get is of course more data points, but we'll also see much stronger variance in our estimated performance, just due to noise, due to the fact that sometimes we'll get samples that perform better uh, than average, or sometimes we'll get samples that perform worse than average. And that also means that our confidence bands will be much wider, so we have much less certainty of what is the actual level of current performance. So we have a trade-off here between how often we want to get uh, our performance estimates versus how good we want to have them. Now uh, we are going to the kind of last two most technical sections when we talk about the actual items to estimate model performance. Uh, the first one is CPP, uh, which stands for Continuous Based Performance Estimation. We're not very creative with names. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to try to estimate the confusion matrix. And then based on that confusion matrix, uh, if we have the expected confusion matrix, we can just estimate any model metric we want that is based on that confusion matrix, even the rock AUC and average precision. How do we do it? Let's say that our first prediction we're going to take, we're going to do it step by step. So for every data point in our current chunk of data, we're going to take um, a prediction. Let's say that our first prediction predicts class one. And we already know that the prediction is not negative. So we can put uh, a zero in the true negative and the false negative cell, because by definition, we predict positive, we know that the prediction is positive. We also see that the predicted probability is 0.7. And bear with me here, assume that this predicted probability is actually the true probability of this data point being positive. If we can just roll off that assumption, we can already say that in expectation, there is a 70% chance that this data point will turn out to be true positive and 30% chance that this data point will turn out to be false positive. This is really the key insight of how to estimate performance uh, for classification models. If we can assume that we can trust this predicted probability, then in expectation, we can get confusion matrix that will have uh, fractional values, and if we get enough of data points, we'll be able to actually create an estimate of any metric we want. So if we get another data point that is, has a negative prediction and the actual predicted probability is 0.4, we can fill it in, and then we can just use that confusion matrix to get any metric we want, such as estimate accuracy, <coughs> where we just take the actual cell values, and then we um, compute the expected metric. Okay, but we cannot trust those numbers. We cannot trust the predicted probabilities. Uh, just because the model output 0.7, it does not mean that the actual probability of this data point turning out to be positive is 70%. This is unfortunately not how machine learning works. And it's not something that we can say is true, even on average, even in aggregate, even in expectation. And that's where calibration comes in. Calibration is a process of turning these predicted probabilities into actual probabilities, where we can then say, and we can talk about them as probabilities, where given basically infinite, but large enough sample size in practice, we can then say, uh, that the expected fraction of positives that we want to observe is going to be equal to the predicted probability of these data points. So if we get 1,000 data points that have predicted probability of 0 0.9, if that is a real probability, we can expect 900 of them uh, to turn out to be positive. And of course, this expectation is going to match reality more and more as we increase our sample size. That's why aggregating with enough data points is so essential. Uh, but let's come back to the problem at hand, and the problem is that we don't have real probabilities. Uh, what I plot, actually, not uh, what scikit learn plotted here, or person that made scikit learn docs, which are basically, by the way, amazing when it comes to calibration. Uh, what they plotted here is the mean predicted probability of a bucket, where we basically take the uh, our predictions on the test set and we put them in buckets that correspond to. Uh, Let's say we put them in 10 buckets that correspond to specific mean predicted probabilities. So this bucket has mean predicted probability of uh, 0.05, and all the predictions between 0 and let's say 0 0.01 go in that bucket, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. That's how we construct the x-axis here. 
And then for each of those buckets, we're going to compute on the test set the actual fraction of positives that we observe, that we see on that uh, test set. And if uh, the model was well calibrated, what we would expect is a straight line. Basically, what we'd like to see is that the actual mean predicted probability of the bucket corresponds to actual fraction of positives. But as you can see here, uh, with basically all uh, machine learning models, also including neural networks of all kinds, whether transformers, CNNs, or uh, anything else you want with skip connections or without skip connections, we will get very strongly miscalibrated models. Uh, there is one exception. That exception is logistic regression. Even here, you see that it's not perfectly calibrated. It actually should be uh, calibrated in expectation. So if you, for some reason, mostly regulation reason, use uh, logistic regression to do your job, then probably you don't need to calibrate your models. Now, let's figure out how we can actually calibrate those models. So what we want to do is we want to take that line that we observe, the calibration curve, and we want to turn it into a perfect calibration curve, which is a straight line. The way we do it is we're going to fit in one-dimensional regression. Uh, generally speaking, there are three kinds of models that are used there. It's either a sigmoidal regression. As you can see here, some curves really look like sigmoid. So we can assume that the distribution is sigmoidal, and we can fit sigmoidal regression. We can fit isotonic regression, which assumes that if x increases, y cannot go down. So it has this baked in assumption of isotonicity. Uh, or we can just use a gradient boosted model. And what we're going to do is we're going to basically map uh, the current uh, the current point in, in that curve to a point where we would see the actual. So we're going to adjust the classifier's predictive probability so that it matches the fraction of positives. The way we do it is we're going to just for every point try to predict the class given the classifier's predictive probability. And then we get something that is reasonably close to a straight line, of course, making sure we don't overfit that uh, calibrate. And then if we have that, we can say that on average for the entire reference set, so our test set, and for the reference covariate distribution, these probabilities are calibrated. So we can use them to estimate performance. Of course, we want to estimate performance for the shifted data. So for different covariate distribution, so this point, uh, we're going to have to kind of skirt around. I want to mention here, because we developed a new algorithm called PAPE that actually takes that into account and is able to adjust the um, calibration for the current covariate distribution we have. And that also means that the performance estimation is better. Today, we're not going to go there. Uh, suffice to say that CBP, even if we're going to actually get slightly miscalibrated probabilities will still output a quite reliable uh, performance estimates. They will be nowhere near as good as the other algorithm that they, takes that into account, but it is much better than using univariate or multivariate detection methods. Just to give you an example of how this works and an example of a multivariate detection false, false, uh, false negative, we see here that according to multivariate detection signal, there is no significant drift. It's all within expected variance that we noticed on our reference set, so our test set. And yet, we see a very strong change in model performance here. Uh, we see a drop of, let's say, more than 10 percentage points in accuracy. So something that definitely should be flagged and that we should definitely be informed about. And yet, multivariate detection actually misses that and CVP captures that really, really well. Now we're kind of slowly nearing the end of it. Let's talk about DLE. DLE is actually a simpler algorithm. Uh, it's an algorithm for estimating model performance for regression. And here, what we're going to do is instead of using predictive probabilities, which we don't have access to in most of the regression models, uh, we're going to just train another model and in this example here, we're going to train an LGPM because that's what we use internally at many ML. And we're going to train it on the actual monitored model inputs and model predictions. And then what we're going to train it to predict is the loss metric that we choose. Let's say squared error, absolute error, logarithmic error, or any other error that you want. You can use pinball loss. You can use 
humming error or anything you want. Uh, and we're gonna try to predict it. So we're gonna calculate that target on the test set. This all happens on the test set. Uh, so we're gonna get the loss on the test set and we're gonna train that model on our main test set to try to predict uh, the expected loss of a model given model inputs and model predictions. And what actually happens is then we can use that LGPM to estimate the loss landscape. So if we had a uh, specific data distribution on the set, we would be able to create this kind of heat map of expected loss. Again, very similar to the heat map we saw before for CPPE. And then we can use that heat map, which is basically just input model inputs to the model and getting expected in this case squared or out to estimate model performance. The way we do it here, for example, is we take the current chunk, we see that the data distribution has shifted very strongly and has shifted to regions where the expected squared error is really, really high. So then we're gonna compute squared error for each of those predictions separately. We're gonna then take the mean of that and we have our MSE. Then we can take a, a quadratic root if we want and we get our RMSE of that specific uh, chunk. So we can actually estimate model performance without touching the labels, without waiting for the labels immediately after uh, we get enough data to aggregate it for the current chunk. And again, quick results here. Uh, we see that multivariate detection basically starts spiking and at some point just really we see very strong drift, but uh, the uh, DLE and the uh, actual realized accuracy, sorry, accuracy, it should not be accuracy. This is MAE, uh, as you can see here. Uh, the MAE actually stays fairly consistent with specific jumps here and there, which are actually not very well shown here. And even if we see a very strong data drift here, when PCA reconstruction error increases more than twofold, we see that the model performance stays very consistent with the actual um, test set. Now we're almost ready to wrap up. Let's summarize what we all hopefully learned here today. First, model performance deteriorates with time. Uh, the targets do not arrive before the damage is done, so we cannot rely on the targets to simply compute performance. Uh, and uh, to make matters worse, data drift signals themselves cannot be used. I'm going to add signals here to be a bit more specific. Cannot be used as a proxy for model performance degradation. So we cannot just measure the strength of data drift and use it as a proxy for model performance or model performance change or model performance degradation because there is actually no correlation whatsoever. And the algorithms that we use, machine learning algorithms, could not pick up any meaningful signals in data drift signals to use to to predict performance degradation. However, there's good news. We can quantify the impact of covariate shift on model performance without targets. And we can use CBPE and PAPE. Um, and for regression tasks, we can use DLE. And these are all algorithms we developed at Nanima and they're available for free. And just one more thing in terms of how we should actually monitor our machine learning models. We should always start with performance monitoring, either estimating performance or calculating it, but calculating is not possible. So start always with estimating performance. If you see a drop in expected performance, then you can trigger root cause analysis and issue resolution. And I have another talk that focuses on that. Uh, you can check it out. It's on uh, our YouTube. When I walk you through exactly how you should go from performance monitoring to automated root cause analysis, how to conduct root cause analysis, and how to then resolve any issues uh, that will have arisen if you let your machine learning makes predictions for long enough.